this is Ken it's Owen. He founded the Channel Islands Restoration called CIR along with a friend more than 20 years ago. Ken is a CIR executive director. He has more than 20 years of experience managing large scale, large scale ecological restoration projects in sensitive natural areas on the California coast. Wow. His experience in education spans 30 years, instructing the public on topics such as ecology, plant identification, and habitat restoration techniques. Ken re recently helped lead a nearly $20 million capital project to save the West Mesa of the San Marcos foothills in Santa Barbara from development. It's yours, Ken. I'm excited. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And one little correction, I wouldn't say I led the campaign. Uh, Channel Islands Restoration was front and center. We were the, the nonprofit that uh, actually took title to the land and, and we raised a lot of money and, and helped spearhead it in a way. But, um, oh man, the whole community came together and some really, really great folks really led the campaign. Yeah. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. I'm here to talk about the uh, Channel Islands and various ecological restoration <laughs> projects that happen out there. Uh, first off, our organization, Channel Islands Restoration, is a 501c3 nonprofit. We're a habitat restoration contractor. We'll talk about what that means in a little bit. Uh, we're an environmental consulting organization as well. So we write restoration plans and things like that. Uh, we do environmental education uh, like I'm doing right now and with lots of kids. And we were founded uh, officially back in 2002, but we really started our work as volunteers uh, around the year 2000. So this map shows uh, our major project locations and uh, including uh, on the Channel Islands. And hopefully you're all seeing this video okay, but uh, you can see that we're pretty spread out, uh, not just on the Channel Islands, but also on the adjacent mainland. So we basically work from the uh, northern end of uh, Santa Barbara County um, all the way down to, uh, I would say, uh, Actually, we're down to uh, Bologna Wetland. I don't have a dot for that yet. This is an old movie. And also, there's uh, we're doing a lot of work in the Angeles National Forest, which aren't reflected on this map. Um, one little dot I passed over was uh, a spot right on the Palos Verdes Peninsula, and that, of course, is Peck Park. And I'd love to say that we were involved in this project in a big way. We weren't. Um, after everything happened at one point, Arcadis US brought us in to uh, control the invasive plants that were trying to move into the restoration site. So we did that for like four years, but that was a while ago. But we did work in your neighborhood and uh, we were happy to do that. Uh, we've worked with over 10,000 individual adult volunteers over the 20 years doing all kinds of different stuff, but also lots and lots of kids. Over 3,400 kids have gone out to the Channel Islands with us on service learning trips, and we do in-class education and that kind of thing. Uh, I want to give you a little introduction of the California Channel Islands now. There they are. So geographers break up the uh, group into uh, two, two different groups. Northern Channel Islands, the San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, and Anacapa, really off the Santa Barbara and Ventura coast. Whereas the uh, Southern group, the Southern Islands off of Los Angeles or down to San Diego is uh, San Nicolas, Santa Barbara, San Clemente. And then really what is probably the most famous or I'm sure is the most famous uh, Channel Island, and that is Catalina. A lot of people say, oh, is that part of the Channel Islands? Oh, most certainly. Uh, it just uh, really stands out because of all the history starting in the 19th century there. Uh, it stands out biologically for other reasons too. Um, now I should, when we look at the eight Channel Islands, we should kind of remember that there was a ninth at one time or another, and that was the Palos Verdes Peninsula up until the Pleistocene that was uh, uh, 
sea level uh, uh, levels, sea levels, and the level of the Los Angeles Basin. Uh, sea level was higher, Los Angeles Basin was lower, and at that time that would have been an island. And then when I'm up on Lacumber Peak or on Santa Cruz Island looking south, I often get uh, um, uh, a little confused when I see the Palos Verdes Peninsula because it's very prominent from up here uh, and looks like another island if you uh, aren't used to it. Uh, five of the eight uh, Channel Islands make up Channel Islands National Park and the uh, Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. Island ownership, so in the south, uh, San Nicolas and San Clemente are wholly owned by the U.S. Navy. Um, Santa Barbara Island is uh, owned by Channel Islands National Park, and Catalina is primarily owned by the Catalina Island Conservancy and the Catalina Island Company. And then, of course, there's multiple uh, residents who uh, own property there, too. In the Northern Islands, um, San Miguel Island is still owned by the U.S. Navy, but uh, Channel Islands National Park administers the island as a part of the park. People can visit there. Santa Rosa Island is wholly owned by the park. Santa Cruz is actually um, divided into two different ownerships. The Nature Conservancy owns 76% and the park 24%. Oops. And uh, Anacapa Island is also part of the National Park. Um, so just in Channel Islands National Park, there's 145 endemic species. Endemic meaning a species that's limited to a certain geographical area. In this case, we're talking about organisms like the island fox or island scrub jay or that, even that cute skunk and many, many, many plants and salamanders and mice and on and on and on that have been isolated for um, a great deal of time um, from the, their mainland ancestors and have managed to make it to the Channel Islands through various means, but not by a land bridge. It was, uh, the islands uh, uh, were always, um, once they separated from the mainland, uh, and that's a whole other discussion, uh, they were always apart from the mainland. So there's a lot of animals that you would expect in on the mainland that you wouldn't have on the islands like raccoons and gophers and deer and elk and on and on and on that just never made it out there. But pygmy mammoths or mammoths did. Anyway, these organisms are very special uh, because they exist on the Channel Islands, nowhere else in the world. And this is just a handful of them. And I'm only talking about the National Park. Um, you know, someday I'll update this slide and be able to say all eight Channel Islands have this many endemic species. I don't know what it is. It's massive. They're, it's the neat thing about islands. Islands breed species. We'll talk about that in a moment. In fact, right about now. Um, islands are important. They only make up uh, 3% of the uh, Earth's surface, uh, um, but they, make, uh, they constitute 20% of the Earth's species. So um, islands, like I said a moment ago, are basically species generators. Uh, plants and animals uh, get out to the two islands, get separated from their ancestral populations, and then evolve into uh, a more appropriate form for the island. And that might usually mean smaller organisms often get larger, larger organisms often get uh, smaller, so that's island dwarfism and gigantism. Uh, well, that's a whole presentation, but it's really uh, interesting to see these these species that are created on these islands, including ours right off the coast here. Um, most extinctions of animals have happened, or plants and animals, most of them that have gone extinct were on islands. Um, and uh, you can see that. I won't go into the great detail, but um, yeah, overall, uh, they are also, so these are, these animals, these, these uh, organisms are unduly impacted um, uh, as well. Um, in fact, there's 39% uh, of the animal species, 51% of the plant species in the world that are endangered are on islands. Here's a couple local ones, you know, the island fox, which 
isn't endangered anymore. It's just threatened. They got taken off the endangered species list, but that's just one little plant there that I have. Um, on, uh, it's a bed straw that is uh, found only on the Channel Islands and is very rare, close to extinction. Um, the real reason that uh, these islands are so vulnerable, of course, is that these organisms that have lived out there for millennia uh, have not developed uh, defenses against introduced species. So um, invasive or introduced species or introduced species that become invasive, which means that they spread aggressively are are the real problem and on the islands and particularly the rats are a cause for extinction all over the world on islands um, so uh, but cats and yes that's a goat up in a tree on on San Clemente Island it's not a very good picture but it's just amazing how goats can climb trees to get out every little bit of vegetation that they want uh, um, so moving on um, that's why islands are important. Let's go on to the topic of what ecological restoration is. Um, most of you probably know that, but you know it's always important to to make sure that people do. But the the dry definition of it is returning the functional aspects of a given ecosystem to a semblance of its predisturbed state, thereby increasing the number and variety of organisms that live there, i.e., increasing the biodiversity. So there's some pictures of biodiverse. Um, landscapes, um, areas, and they are a mixture of multiple species that interact with each other, multiple plant species primarily. So if you're talking about a habitat, you're usually talking about the plants. And uh, in areas where there's a lot of diversity uh, of plants, you end up with a lot of diversity of animals. And where invasive species or, or construction or uh, have shrunk uh, diversity, wherever that happens, then the animals that depend on that uh, diversity disappear or uh, go down in number dramatically. So on the Channel Islands, uh, here's some of the uh, most uh, problematic animals, pigs and, and black rats, like I mentioned, uh, and others that you're familiar with, like the bison on uh, Catalina, but um, also cats on Catalina and San Clemente, and they were on San Nicolas. Real um, impact deer and elk. And then you got your plants like the mustards and the, uh, but particularly the ice plant. That's the biggest problem. On Catalina, you got the flax leaf broom that spreads all over the place. So there's a lot of different uh, impacts, and I'll talk about that right now from goats, from deer, from elk, from sheep, uh, and pigs and, and rats, uh, et cetera. As an example of sheep overgrazing, here's San Miguel Island. By the 1930s, it was stripped of its vegetation almost entirely. And the island was just covered in sand dunes. Um, there was even a huge sand spit sticking out of the island because all of the vegetation had really been taken out by overgrazing by sheep that were left on the island starving and uh, working to get the last little tiny green stuff wherever they could find it and it ended up as a giant sand dune primarily or uh, practically whereas you look at the 2000s in that picture the darkness in there is vegetation um, that are those are some kind of plant holding the soil there except where you see the streaks of sand dunes the 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 um, those are still uh, obviously there but they've reduced uh, down to maybe what was an historical level you know it's just kind of a windy sandy island but it has lots of vegetation on it now just by removing the sheep and burrows and things that were out there and that happened back in the 1960s one of the first islands to have the feral animals removed and it's snapped back in an incredible way not entirely but an incredible uh, to a degree. Um, just an example here, Santa Cruz Island. Um, uh, there's uh, 
sheep were removed in the 80s on the Nature Conservancy side, but uh, they were removed in the 90s on the Park Service side. And there was fencing between them. And you can see that uh, the practices on the uh, Nature Conservancy side going way back to the 1800s and the original ranchers were uh, uh, sheep grazing was done very carefully. Um, they uh, did not overgraze, whereas the ranch on the eastern end of the island to the right of on this picture, um, sheep were just allowed to roam and go wild, go feral. And they caused a lot of erosion problems, a lot of issues, eating rare plants, plants that are only found on the Channel Islands, nowhere else in the world, and are disappearing. And there were sheep punching them down. Some sheep grazing is great. We use it all the time. Actually, the sheep in the upper right-hand corner, hey, we hired them. <laughs> so I put them up there because, uh, excuse me, they can be an impact, uh, a huge impact like you see here. Um, uh, plants are, can be a real impact. So up in the upper right-hand corner, that's crystalline ice plant. Ah, it's a scourge. Look at what happened on Atacapa. Starting um, in the, well, really starting in the 30s when the uh, Coast Guard built that light station and those buildings and started planting uh, a, a red flowered ice plant as a erosion control. So you went from that left uh, picture shows a lot of diversity in the landscape. It shows invasive plants, but it shows native ones too. So the purple, uh, uh, ish color there and the yellows uh, are all native wildflowers whereas the red is ice plant so you can see it's already by late 70s spreading out from the buildings uh, and taking over the habitat then look at 2010 it's totally taken over the habitat uh, if you sit back and do nothing invasive species will slowly take over that's that's what they're known for that's their shtick um, and uh, it was a, a real problem on Anacapa, but it's a problem on Santa Barbara Island and, and the smaller islands are just really being hammered by ice plant. So look at what happened on Anacapa on the left there. That is what biologists call a monoculture. That's a, just about a single plant. And you, know, you notice even the gulls are kind of mostly on the edges there. They don't really like the ice plant. Uh, and not much else does. Some things do, but generally speaking, whenever you have a plant that takes over a habitat like this and then just fills in and removes everything else or pushes out everything else, you end up with a huge drop in biodiversity. Less things can use that habitat than could before. Oh, something, somebody might like it. Some organism might like ice plant, do really well. But overall, your diversity drops dramatically. And that's a real problem on the Channel Islands. Because again, these species are only found there and nowhere else in the world, a lot of them are. Um, so we'll talk about the different kinds of uh, projects that, that uh, land managers uh, and, and folks like us have initiated on the islands. We work with plants, we don't work with animals, um, except that we supported Friends of the Island Fox for, for quite a while and still partner with them, a group, which I'll talk about in a bit. But we, we do habitat. Uh, other people have gone after the rats. They've gone after the cats. They've taken off the pigs. Um, and and uh, we'll go into uh, a lot of these examples of a lot of these. So upper right corner, native plant propagation installation, a lot of that going on nurseries that we've built and other people have built on various islands. And in the lower right-hand corner, I'm not gonna talk about Plant, you know, big, huge reconstruction projects, but that's an example of one on Santa Cruz Island where they brought in um, heavy equipment to dig out a wetland that had been filled in in the 18, 1900s. Uh, but uh, that's the only real huge one like that that's happened so far on the Channel Islands. Uh, so these problematic animals, when we're talking about the vertebrates, we got a little chart here. Um, Basically, I, I get to update this periodically and uh, um, you can see just uh, 
it's organized by island and then you read to the right and it's, it shows you what kind of animal is present if it's got a red or, or green dot it's uh, animal is present so rats on uh, San Miguel uh, are there. Red means that there's not been an attempt to remove them yet, not started. Uh, and you go over to the right and you'll see that there are sheep, uh, were sheep there. Green means they have been removed. And so were the donkeys. That's San Miguel. But then you read that for the rest of them. And then, you know, what you want to do is maybe take your eye and look at the red. So in Catalina, we're looking at rats, we're looking at deer and black buck and buffalo and cats. San Clemente rats and house mice and uh, cats, uh, really a, a real problem uh, for these agencies who are trying to manage endangered species and uh, you know, on their on the islands. Okay, so the first um, project that I'm going to talk about is uh, probably one of the most famous restoration stories in the world. And that is uh, the interaction between the island fox, um, bald eagles, golden eagles, feral pigs, and sick dogs. Well, sort of. Sick dogs sort of get in there. But um, the island fox is a remarkable animal. Um, it was likely introduced by people. That's the, the, the current thinking, is that Chumash people introduced them to the Northern Channel Islands. And then through DNA study, they've been able to figure that some of those foxes um, were released on the Southern Channel Islands, Catalina and the San Clemente and San Nicolas. Um, and they are from mostly, as I recall, San Miguel Island foxes. Each of these foxes, uh, they may have only been out there, we don't know when they were introduced. People have been around for a long time, uh, 13,000 years or so but it might've been a lot more recently. And already these animals have shrunk down to the size of a medium-sized cat. They're, they only weigh about four pounds. They look like baby foxes, uh, but they're not, they're just dwarf foxes. And each island has its own flavor of fox, its own subspecies with a slight morphological differences, different, different um, number of vertebrae in one case. Um, uh, and so through, as I said, through um, DNA study, they realized that they were moved to the Southern Islands. So why are people bringing foxes out? Originally it was thought maybe they rafted out. That's a term used in island um, biogeography, meaning to say uh, an organism gets washed out to sea and then uh, washes up on an island and sets up housekeeping. Uh, with another fox or a pregnant female or whatever. That's all, how a lot of organisms got there uh, naturally um, before people started introducing them. But the fox apparently was introduced uh, maybe just because people love to have an animal around that ate mice. Uh, and, and they're cute and they're wonderful when you, uh, they're pretty tame. So they were probably a, uh, essentially a, a pet. And that's that's the kind of thinking now. But they're an amazing uh, animal. Let me go back. Uh, just uh, remarkable if you ever see one, and you will. Go to Santa Cruz Island, particularly. Scorpion Harbor, they're hanging around the campground. You've got to protect yourself against them. They'll get in your tent. They'll get in your food. They're, they're pests in that sense. Just there, the rest of the island, it's got a healthy population eating normal things that foxes are supposed to be eating, not camper food. Okay, so the timeline for all of this is um, back in uh, prior to the European uh, colonization of California, uh, things were pretty much in balance, uh, even with the native people, uh, they uh, lived in, in balance. There were, on the Channel Islands, there were bald eagles historically, um, foxes and people and plants all pretty much coexisting. But by the mid 1800s, European settlers had brought in sheep and pigs and fennel there, other non-native species that started causing really um, big problems. The pigs escaped and started reproducing. And by the 1950s, 
two other events occurred that really um, caused problems for the island foxes. Um, and that is uh, that uh, DDT or the byproduct DDE poisoning uh, killed off all the eagles in Southern California, bald eagles in Southern California. So um, they were eliminated. They just died off in the islands because of poisoning and golden eagles, uh, and I'll say why in a little while, were not uh, affected. And so they started setting up housekeeping on Santa Cruz Island. They hadn't nested there, Santa Cruz and Santa Rosa. They hadn't nested there historically, but now their com competition was gone. And um, in the 1850s, pigs had been introduced and were uh, reproducing at a great rate. So golden eagles realized, hey, this is a pretty good place to hang out. There's pigs, there's foxes. Uh, the pigs are, you know, piglets and foxes are all small. So golden eagles started nesting on the Channel Islands. Um, also around uh, 2000 canine distemper um, killed off most of the island fox population on Catalina. Um, at least that's the suspected disease that spread there. The isthmus was spared because uh, they actually, uh, it just didn't reach there. And uh, so from that, the, the, the fox population was reduced very low, but uh, not quite extinct. So on Santa Cruz Island, um, I mean, I should say just the result of all this is the, uh, an extinction crisis. So the fox populations on the islands that I've mentioned um, drop dramatically. So San Clemente and San Nicolas were spared, but Catalina, Santa Rosa, and Santa Cruz uh, were losing, um, and San Miguel were losing their fox population. They were almost gone down to just a few individuals on some of these islands. So how do you put this all back together? You know, how can you fix such a complicated problem? And it's really quite amazing because the National Park Service and the Nature Conservancy put together a multi-pronged plan to breed island foxes, to break, bring back the golden eagles, to get rid of the pigs and, and uh, uh, relocate the golden eagles. Uh, and this all happened concurrently. I'm gonna go through them sequentially, but remember these all happened pretty much at the same time. Really amazing story. Controversial as all hell, I can say that. Very controversial because it involved um, hunting the pigs uh, and that um, meant a lot of lawsuits and uh, animal rights activists who were very angry about that. I'd love to talk to you about the details of that. Uh, I, I watched that whole process go on and I have a very strong opinion on it, but uh, you know, if you want to ask me later, we'll talk about that. <laughs> They, uh, in order to make this uh, a pig hunt basically a uh, reality, they fenced off five different sections of the island. So this takes the Nature Conservancy and the Park Service cooperating and building this really extensive fence system so that if you cleared out area one and uh, or you cleared out the island, but there was a, a small population over in area five, they wouldn't spread to the rest of the areas that had been cleared. So really expensive uh, and involved fencing system. A fencing system, by the way, that allowed foxes to get through it, but not pigs. So how did they get rid of the pigs? Well, they used a lot of walk-in traps. I'll have to say those were for the dumb ones, I'm afraid, who just walked right into traps, but others did not. And um, they were hunted from the air, um, no poisons were used or anything like that. And there were um, was an American, uh, not the agency that, um, just forgot the agency's name that uh, the Humane Society, I believe, uh, um, set the standards for humane treatment when in, in, with youth, euthanasia. But there's a lot of questions. People ask me, well, why didn't you serve them you know, take them back to the mainland and serve them up on, on plates and, you know, all that kind of thing. And why do they have to be removed? And why are you playing God anyway? All of these, um, and, and remember, <laughs> I support this project. We were not involved with it. Um, this was uh, uh, a New Zealand company came in called ProHunt and uh, they 
won the contract uh, because they are an international experts at removing um, feral animals. They have a lot of them in New Zealand. So um, one of the things that had to happen is the golden eagles had to be removed. And that's a hard thing to do because it's a threatened species, it's a native species. It just decided to set up housekeeping, as I said. And so to try to bring things back to balance, um, the uh, decision was made to capture the eagles and relocate them, the golden eagles. And so um, I'll go into some details of that, but basically um, it took a little while to figure out why are our foxes all disappearing? Uh, and they were uh, being taken to eagle nests, that's why. And uh, some excavations of eagle nests found lots and lots of fox remains. And then people just started photographing the, the actual uh, attacks and um, predation uh, of, these big, enormous six foot wingspan, you know, animals, these <laughs> golden eagles are just, if you ever go on YouTube and <laughs> look at what golden eagles do, uh, pulling goats off the sides of mountains, mountain goats, so they'll drop down and then the eagle can go after them, you know, real crazy stuff. And um, they're really voracious predators. And the other thing that I want to note here is that they uh, hunt fresh meat. Unlike bald eagles, which I'll talk about in a moment, golden eagles go after live prey and they can easily take down a fox or a small pig. Um, so uh, there were various attempts to uh, um, go back, uh, to capture these animals. Uh, they they're very wily they're smart they do not get captured easily and uh some some were but others were really hard to uh to get at they were in remote locations and uh, a helicopter was used for a while to chase the eagles to tire them out so they wouldn't land and and, and when they did land they could be netted um <laughs> i don't know that's like 1200 dollars an hour for the helicopter I was there for that. That's the one thing that I did is I volunteered on one of those expeditions and uh, the helicopter got tired, not the eagle. The eagle just simply went up a canyon or whatever. And you could see the idea is that keep it flapping, keep it flapping, keep it, no, no, or sort of absolute failure. <laughs> Fun though, it was interesting for me. Um, so, but generally speaking, traps were used to capture most of the, the eagles and uh, baited with pigs or and things like that. And there are these clamshell traps because you have to be extremely careful not to harm this threatened native species, the golden eagle, while you're trying to relocate it. So ornithologists would have these clamshell, they're called, you know, type net laid out and with a remote trigger, they'd be watching from about a mile away. And then when the bird was right in the middle, so wouldn't get injured, they pull the trigger literally and capture themselves an eagle. Uh, it was, it, they had a lot of uh, fear that they weren't gonna get the last of them because these last few were breeding and just going after foxes in a huge number to feed their young. And it was, they were just, you know, about to just munch the last of the foxes. But they were captured, all of them, uh, 40 from Santa Rosa and Santa Cruz and relocated to mostly Northeastern California, where apparently it's great eagle habitat. How I doing it, okay? So again, concurrently, um, another eagle project was happening to try to bring back the balance of this whole system that's out of whack. And that's um, breeding bald eagles. So bald eagles, are native to uh, North America, of course, and they are also native to the Channel Islands. It's actually perfect habitat for them. Bald eagles are primarily, uh, primarily feed on carrion. They will take live prey, but just not as often as they'll munch down a nice um, rotten sea lion on a, on a beach somewhere. So they love ocean cliffs, marine carrion. They also, of course, take fish right from the water. And apparently once in a while they might munch on a fox, but it was, uh, would be considered extremely rare. Um, 
but it's speculated that they do, or there might be some evidence that they do, but it's rare. It's the golden eagles that eat foxes. Bald eagles are more into the marine resources. And when they disappeared because uh, of what I'm gonna talk about poisoning, then the bald eagles had no more competition, as I said earlier. So up until, or really starting in the late forties, DDT was considered a miracle chemical. And, and you know, nowadays, especially in California, we have a totally different process for approving chemical use. And that wasn't around in, <laughs> then. So DDT was used in massive m amounts of sprayed on school children and uh, I mean, really everywhere, mostly to kill insects. And, and apparently it's good for me. I don't know what the tune was for that, but these dancing little critters talking about how great DDT is. Well, it's um, problem is, is that in the creation, one of the problems in creation of DDT is that you end up with a lot of waste product, DDE. And the Montrose Chemical Company dumped a large amount of that just uh, between Catalina and the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Um, and it's still there. There's a huge dump site there. They just literally tossed in uh, drums. But also, um, under permit, mind you, they flush their waste into the uh, LA sewer system. And so that was another source of contamination. Really, to clean this, the sewer system up, they, uh, who owns it, but whoever the agency was, sent in um, a, a team to scrub all their pipes in hazmat suits to get rid of the res residual DDE that was in all these uh, drain pipes going to the ocean. Resulting in this, uh, the result of this is that, and you know, we we have contamination problems all over the country, and these are you know amounts in parts per million. Um, but the idea here is to compare what Southern California looks like compared to some other locations. So we have a lot of DDE contamination. Um, it uh, moves from uh, the sediments up through the fish and the sea lions and the birds and even and when we eat the fish into us. So it's um, you know, very present in the environment at lower levels than it used to be, but still there. Um, the real uh, tragedy of it all, of course, was that many different bird species uh, came close to disappearing from uh, the Channel Islands or did, like the bald eagles disappeared. Brown pelican almost disappeared. Do we remember the time when we didn't have any brown pelicans for a while? And now they're abundant. Um, peregrine falcons are another, and, and that's just a short list of uh, birds that had um, egg thinning issues as a result of all the contamination. Somebody's got their audio on and I'm hearing a tone. Okay, the feedback or something, good, it's gone. Um, so part of the, uh, part of the project then, or, or the, this overall <laughs> putting it all back together again is to bring back the, the bald eagles to Southern California. So I don't remember where the original juveniles were uh, captured, but they were released on Catalina Island and those are hack towers, uh, square towers, uh, boxes and jails basically to get the animals acclimated before they release them. So those are um, juvenile bald eagles there. It's, they look like very dark and uh, they're adorable. They look like little dinosaurs, I think. Uh, just, you can really see the uh, relation, uh, the relationship. And, um, but on Catalina, the, the um, contamination was so bad that uh, most of the eggs would uh, fail. Uh, they would crack um, you know, before the chicks were born, hatched. So uh, let's see, it was the San Francisco Zoo, I believe, that um, worked with the um, Catalina Island Conservancy to actually steal the eggs uh, temporarily and replace them with dummies, take the eggs up to all the way to San Francisco, hatch them, and then bring them back. And that was successful, uh, if not sustainable, it was successful anyway, in bringing back 
you know, many pairs of bald eagles on Catalina. And, uh, but they had very thin eggs, eggshells. Um, so the idea was that we would, we, the uh, um, community, and, and, and I, I need to go back actually, sorry, uh, rewind just a little bit back to Montrose um, Chemical Company. So they were eventually sued for all that contamination and um, they settled a multi hundred million dollar lawsuit uh, that created the Montrose Restoration Fund that then go, uh, is going into many projects, but primarily projects to directly address what the dumping did. So this whole um, bald eagle recovery, for instance, is um, funded by that on Catalina and Santa Cruz. So they started the, the work on Santa Cruz because uh, it's further from the contamination source and they were hoping that the eggshells would uh, be more durable, would, you know, that they wouldn't need to intervene in helping these animals um, reproduce. And, and it was the case. Uh, um, so two locations were set up on the eastern end of the island. And really for the first time since the 1940s, we had successful hatching without human intervention on Santa Cruz Island of the bald eagles. And then you see in the lower right hand corner there, just one fishing just in uh, off of Prisoners Harbor. It's just amazing to be out there and go, oh, bald eagle, cool. So that worked really well. Um, in 2007, bald eagles were actually taken off the endangered species list. And as of 2019, anyway, we had uh, 60 eagles on just the Northern Channel Islands. I don't know where we are on Catalina, but they're, they've got a healthy population. And, and actually, let me go back to that. So uh, it was a bit controversial really to, to reprogram that money towards Santa Cruz Island, a controversial with um, Catalina Island Conservancy, as you can imagine. Um, but following that, they had successful hatching um, even without intervention. So I don't think, uh, I, don't, I don't know, um, why that happened, but um, they didn't have money to capture the eggs anymore and take them up to San Francisco. And so I guess they were just watching to see if it would work without that. And it did. They have successful hatching out there now without having to steal the eggs. Um, okay, so we'll go on to another program happening at the same time. So, you know, these foxes are almost gone. They were down to like under 100 individuals in Santa Cruz Island. And uh, real big extinction crisis uh, happening rather suddenly. So they, uh, Park Service and Nature Conservancy, I'm sorry about the audio there. I could tell that it was weird. Um, Park Service and the Nature Conservancy um, started a uh, breeding program in pens like this. This one was on Santa Rosa. And then they bred foxes. And this is the appropriate point in the presentation to go, ah, if you're so inclined. But yeah, they're cute, especially the babies. Um, the infants are very uh, adorable and they uh, were released. Now, I will tell you that they started, you know, again, these are concurrent projects. They started breeding these foxes and releasing them before the golden eagles were completely gone. And so a lot of these foxes got eaten, but it was again controversial and they were really attacked for that. But um, they couldn't keep foxes in cages and definitely you have to let them go if they're gonna be wild. And they were working on the golden eagle program, program but problem, but they only had those few, you know, like two nesting pairs left who were voraciously finding meat wherever they could to feed their kids, their young. And um, so foxes were being put out into the wild and eaten. Uh, it was a, kind of a dark moment, but um, when the golden eagles finally were removed once and for all, the foxes were safe and their population started rebounding from this um, breeding program. On Catalina Island, there was a vaccination program uh, for canine distemper and other diseases implemented for the foxes, which um, 
dramatically uh, allowed the foxes to recover. So this is where we were around 2000. And then after all these efforts, um, up till 2014, 2014 is when I have figures for, I don't know where we are right now. Uh, if you want to find out, go to Friends of the Island Fox and uh, they'll give you the current numbers. I didn't have time to <laughs> give you those or change this chart or anything. But just the point is crash and then back up again. Um, you know, great to see. Um, yeah, as of um, a few years ago, there were um, 171 foxes on San Miguel and they were down to 15 and uh, the year 2000. And then you can read the rest of them there if you like. Again, San Clemente and San Nicolas Island were not affected by eagles or disease. Um, their, their main problem with mortality is, is car strikes on these islands because they're Navy islands. And they've been doing a really, a lot of really good work to avoid that. Okay, so um, that was the story of the fox and two different eagles and the pigs and throw in a sick dog. Uh, <laughs> That is, for me, one of the most amazing conservation projects in the world that happened right here in our backyard. Uh, it's very cool. I think it worked well. Now, controversial, though. Uh, controversial with animal rights activists, particularly, who filed lawsuits and tried to stop the program. Um, so let's move on to another one. There's this cute little critter called the loggerhead shrike or the San Clemente Island loggerhead shrike that is uh, endemic to San Clemente Island. And they also had an extinction uh, crisis. Um, back in 1998, there were only 14 birds left on the island. Uh, and the reason was is mostly because of ranching and, and cats and rats. So they were really uh, preying on these uh, birds. Um, this chart shows um, the number of breeding pairs, so it was down to less than 10 for quite a few years, and has steadily come back up since then. It, it fluctuates depending on rainfall rates and things like that. But there, are, the Navy, the U.S. Navy, has implemented a uh, did a captive breeding program and um, restoration and reducing of some of the feral animals, not eliminating them. It's a big island. You're not going to get rid of all the rats. You're not going to get rid of all the cats, probably. Um, but you can uh, reduce them, especially in areas where the shrikes are breeding and hunting. And they have, and it's, uh, I, I volunteered on that once. Uh, if you're a birder, you know, you might want to find out what Institute for Wildlife Services is doing out there. You know, they used to provide uh, opportunities to go out and count shrikes. You know, if you want to get to San Clemente, that's one way. Uh, I'll get back to San Clemente in a little while, but let's move to another invertebrate issue, and that's cats on uh, San Nicolas Island. Um, they were a real problem for some um, two endemic species, the island night lizard and the deer mouse. These are found just on the Channel Islands. Um, the uh, island night lizards just on three islands, San to San Clemente, which I'm talking about here, or San Nicholas, sorry, and San Clemente and Santa Barbara Island. Very unique species. And uh, Western snowy plovers that are not endemic, of course, to the Channel Islands, but were really uh, had their populations. They're a threatened species, are protected, and their, their population was being hammered, hammered by cats on San Nicholas. So, um, the Navy instituted a program to remove the cats. Um, that took a lot of forms. Um, the Humane Society stepped up. You know, they were against originally the project, but signed on uh, eventually and um, actually took 51 cats off the island themselves and put them in a shelter <laughs> in Ramona. Um, but other cats, you know, that that's not the bulk. That's a figure that the Navy likes to put out, but they don't say, I mean, I guess I could find out, but I never have just how many were euthanized. Uh, but they are uh, feral cats, you can't do much with them. And, um, but you know, 
again, animal rights activists, people who just love cats like me, but uh, who are similar to me, just viscerally react badly to the idea of harming kitty cats. So uh, it was controversial, as I say, but, you know, Humane Society helped out and uh, kittens that were captured were adopted. A lot of people adopted kittens because they hadn't um, adopted their feral ways yet. All right, I'm going to talk now about habitat restoration. Let's <laughs> see if we can get through this presentation because uh, there's a lot to talk about. And habitat is really about the plants. Um, native animals love native plants. I, I mentioned that before, diversity. This is where they breed, they feed, they forage, they nest, they, they uh, do all these uh, things in plants. That's, that's their home, that's their habitat. So when you talk about habitat restoration, it's a subset of ecological restoration. It is dealing with just repairing the habitat. This uh, quickly is an example of a, a wetland habitat that's completely taken over by invasive uh, plants. There's a one, one native in this picture, really. It's the oak tree on the right there. You can sort of see that curved um, trunk. So this is a project we did at the Santa Barbara Zoo. So we removed all these invasive trees and plants and then planted natives. And a few years later, we ended up with a functional wetland with lots of diversity um, and space for uh, nesting and, and things like that, which would have been impossible before. So that is how you can fix a habitat. Um, this is an example of Western gulls and Anacapa using little tiny plants that we put in as a home or as shelter, um, especially the ones on the left ran into that little gum plant. It's a small, it's, you know, it's less than a foot high, eight inches maybe, usually, or this one was anyway. And, and they, I'm walking by in a trail and they run in there and, and hide. And then of course I intrusively take a picture of them. But uh, the point is, is a little tiny plant is enough to hide from a peregrine falcon or a red-tailed hawk out on um, Kappa. Um, so we've done a lot on Santa Rosa Island habitat-wise. I'm gonna to try to go through this quickly. It's a very interesting story though. Um, and I'm gonna just focus on one project that we've worked on and that's the uh, restoration of the island oak woodland. So this is a tree that's endemic to just a few of the uh, Channel Islands, not found on the mainland. And the um, overgrazing of cattle and sheep caused uh, huge erosion problems on Santa Rosa. So these poor trees are, tr are uh, have their roots completely exposed, um, covered in lichens, by the way, it's another part of the story. And then on the right there, you see just a lone seedling trying to grow in rock you know that's supposed to and then you can see the roots above it that's supposed to be a soil horizon that's supposed to be several feet of soil um, that's what was there before but it's eroded away so the park service or actually i should say the park service and um, the usgs uh, us Ge geological uh, survey are doing work on analyzing the fog um, on Santa Rosa Island. And the reality is, is that island gets very little rain. I mean, you know, we only get so much rain in Southern California. Most of its precipitation comes from fog. So at one time or another, um, this island should have been covered in much more, much larger oak forests. And all those areas around the oaks would have been uh, thriving with shrubs. Um, all of which would capture huge amounts of water in, in uh, fog events, which are frequent, especially in the summer, and drop that water right onto the ground. And you can see just some uh, stems of the island oak doing that, and they're covered in lichens, a very moist environment. So this was a fog forest at one time or another that um, relied on um, capturing the moisture from the air to, for its primary water source. Um, so the job um, involves a lot of things and uh, including trying to build up that soil horizon again with wattles and check dams uh, and fencing uh, just to 
capture runoff so that you get soil built up again. Um, and so there's extensive waddles throughout the entire uh, environment. And then some of the uh, drainages um, check dams that are uh, really meant to stop the, um, this turning into a small river during rain events. Um, fencing was put up along with irrigation. So there's no water there. You have to truck in the water from another part of the island and um, turn it on and, and let it irrigate the plants. But that irrigation that you see there is not going to all the plants. This is an experiment. This is a, a research experiment. And so um, you'll notice in the foreground, irrigation and three small plants, or four small plants, it's actually several. And then fencing comes in. And in this picture, the irrigation stops right there where one of those fences begins. So those plants are not being irrigated ever. They're just getting fog drip from the fencing. The fencing captures fog and lets it drip down. So lots of different experiments. Uh, when you put something in and you just irrigate it, how does it do? If you put something in and you irrigate it and put in fencing, how does it do? If you put something in and just use fencing, how does it do? Well, um, you can see some of the results. This is a, an irrigated and fenced um, spot really early on, and it was already popping up with native shrubs. And, and we did some active planting in these areas too, but a lot of this is just stuff that's coming in because now there's water. Um, here's a great example of uh, the fence on the left um, doesn't have any irrigation. There's no, or, and none of these have any, this, this picture has no irrigation lines. This is all just fencing um, as a way of capturing the water. And look at what happens on the left side when the fencing ends um, and that area doesn't have any plants, but there's lots of vegetation growing up around the fences where they're getting water. Now these are old pictures. I, I, I need to get back there. These are gonna be much bigger plants now, hopefully, assuming the fog keeps working and, and you know, it's all an experiment, but it, it, it is working. It's uh, really quite striking. Um, okay, We're running out of time here, so I'll try to um, uh, move through a couple more things. We've done a lot of work on San Nicolas Island, owned by the U.S. Navy. Um, Island night lizard is a big concern out there. We built a, a, a nursery, uh, grew many tens of thousands of plants, um, and uh, including grasses and even cactus. Um, night lizards love cactus and they love grass. So these native grasses growing around cactus um, are uh, particularly loved by night lizards. Um, these cactus pads were little tiny things. So this is like, um, you know, six months later kind of thing or four months later and they had already put on a huge amount of growth. They're on irrigation. Uh, and so they, they just love it and they take off. Um, so we're creating massive grassy cactus patches on and, and other things, of course, not just cactus, but on San Nicolas Island. And that's perfect habitat for uh, several species, including the night lizard. Uh, don't have a lot to say about Catalina. I'm not up on what they're uh, doing currently, but they use uh, the American Conservation Experience, which are um, volunteer uh, folks that come out for multiple months and do work. Uh, so they're doing a lot of weed work. The map just shows mapping of uh, uh, rare plants actually on, on um, Catalina Island and where they're um, focusing their restoration. Um, you know, upper right corner is us taking lunch one day at Parsons Landing and then you got Buffalo coming by. It's kind of hard to use volunteers when Buffalo are showing up, you know. <laughs> Everybody stops and, <laughs> and looks. They've got a great nursery out there, a big, big plant nursery. Um, San Clemente Island. So, uh, you know, I'm talking about these islands because they're in your neighborhood. And um, this was an interesting project for us. Um, the, uh, uh, let me go back. So San Diego State University and the Navy uh, partner mostly on the restoration on San Clemente Island, but we have helped on multiple occasions with various projects. This is San Diego State University going after their mustard population and uh, other weeds. 
Um, but these are the planting locations that they've uh, done on the island. And again, you know, this is a picture on the right there of all those shrubs were not there. They're all planted. So the island again was ranched and, and just eaten down to about nothing. And so you don't have a lot of native vegetation on the island unless you plant it. And there are in some places, but these areas were identified as good candidates to fill in these whole hillsides with uh, native plants. We did ice plant removal. Uh, we went out many times, but this was years ago, but we took out over 60 acres of ice plant. It was like this, it was patchy. So it's not solid 60 acres, but patches within the 60 acres, we made big piles. And then um, the following rainy year, this rare plant, this little sun cup came up. These, uh, this is an island endemic plant and they didn't even know they had it there, right there, right in this location. The uh, picture of the, with the gray debris in there, that's dead ice plant. That's, that's an area where we pulled up a huge patch of ice plant and you know, left some debris behind that is dried. And then this native plant popped up in its wake. Love that when it happens. Happens a lot with ice plant and other circumstances we've seen that. Um, fennel, if you know about uh, sweet fennel, it's a real common weed in California, but it's rare on San Clemente Island because um, San Diego State University has eradicated it everywhere, except in these canyons. Um, that was our uh, operations manager, Kevin Thompson, and he was a great climber. Unfortunately, he doesn't work with us anymore. Uh, went on to uh, bigger and uh, better things, but he ran this program for a long time, and that's him and another uh, employee repelling down into canyons to get at these last fennel populations. Nobody did that uh, around. That was a def definitely a <laughs> stepping up and doing some pretty crazy stuff. We don't really have the capability. We don't have any climbers uh, on, on board right now, as far as I know. Maybe we do. Actually, got a lot more employees than I think. But this guy was great, and uh, these, these two employees. So that's what I've got for you. And oh my gosh, I actually got it within time, pretty close, but um, I'd love to answer your questions and this is how you can contact me. And, uh, that's what I got for you. Thank you. I see clapping. <laughs> that's Stephanie. Okay guys, got any, and Richard, does anybody have any questions? Jan Dotemont. Jan, your hands up. I thought I was just clapping. Uh oh, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, anything, I, I kind of rushed through some of those. Uh, <laughs> and there's just a lot of stories. I, I, I've done this presentation for years and I uh, personalize it for the group. So, I wouldn't talk about San Clemente as much or Catalina as much or with other groups that are up here, but you know, you guys are seeing this when you look off the coast and now you get an idea of what's going on out there, um, ecology, you know, uh, uh, restoration wise. And I, I have a question. This is Denise. What technique is used to eradicate things like the, the ice plant? Do they use Roundup or do they use physical means to take the plants away? Or how do they get rid of those plants? All, all of the above. So it's a uh, integrated pest management approach. If you know what that means, that means don't rely on any one technique. Um, for a lot of really good reasons. And uh, one of them is just so you don't use too much chemical. So we, we use kid power, uh, lots and lots, <laughs> lots of kids pulling up ice plant and they had a hell of a time doing it. We, we you know, raised all this money to you know, pay for the boat and pay for the bus and did some in class education. So we're really proud of what we did with them, but oh my God, they love pulling up ice plant. Uh, but we did have staff on the island, this is full disclosure, you know, in national parks, they, um, they do use herbicides. Um, it's just that um, it goes through a huge review process. And again, it's, it's a integrated approach, so you don't just rely on spraying Roundup or something like that. Uh, but some of that ice plant on the island, on the Anacapa Island was sprayed. Uh, the... Uh, 
ice plant that I showed you on Santa Barbara Island is mixed with one native that can handle the salt. You know, take a little time and look up um, crystalline ice plant and the amazing uh, adaptability it has to Mediterranean climates and how it just takes over um, and makes an area just impossible to grow anything else and just attracts salt and just deposits it everywhere. Uh, and there's very few native plants that can survive in that. That one picture I showed you early, just earlier showed mostly ice plant and some, it's called sueda, a native. But that's the only one that can compete. And you couldn't just come in and spray that environment because there are natives in there and it's really patchy. And really nobody knows right now what to do with crystalline ice plant. It is hammering Santa Capa and hammering Santa Barbara Island. Mm -hmm. They've really gone downhill. So I'm, I'm talking about some successes here. The environments on those two islands and, and, and so no, I said Anna Capa and, and uh, Santa Barbara are, it's, it's really gone downhill. The diversity um, is, is getting worse. There's, uh, and uh, the ice plant is a big problem, is one of the big reasons. Ken. Is Ken. Canister the problem? What's that? Ken, must it bird? Oh, sorry, Ann. Didn't mean well, just quickly, Ken, um, Michael Friedman um, sent a message saying that he's hoping you can come back and expand on your presentation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, that would be nice. Yeah. I, uh, he's going to have I, to tell us exactly what he wants expanded on. Yeah, <laughs> there's so much, <laughs> and there's so much I left out. You know, there's all kinds of great stories out there. The, the rat eradication on Anacapa, they did get the rats off of there, uh, but that was really controversial and, and it was hard. So. Adele. I remember um, I remember when we were doing that rat, rat eradication on Anacapa, uh, I've been to that island many times, and the Save the Rats Society or whatever they were called <laughs> was giving you people a horrible time. Yeah, they, um, <laughs> they actually, uh, showed up on the island in the middle of the night and spread vitamin K all over the place because it uh, supposedly um, uh, prevented the anticoagulant poison from working. <laughs> That's in, uh, in uh, that book when the killing's done by uh, a local author. And it's called When the Killing's Done, he did a whole um, kind of a fictionalized uh, story based on events about non-native animal removal on the Channel Islands and the um, crazy war that went on in this community over that. It was just crazy. <laughs> and somebody wrote a, what's his name? I've forgotten now. It'll, it'll come to me, but he wrote a whole book based on the idea. That included animal rights activists spreading uh, vitamin K around. Mm. What, Diane, what? is your hand up? Yes, it is. Ken, um, we arrange tours for docents in normal times. If we ever go back to normal times, any chance we can get a tour of one of the islands with you? Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Got him. No, I, I was telling, I was saying before you all came on that, you know, I love folks that do intern, that um, dedicate themselves to, um, you know, bringing the, the amazing, the amazing California, our, our various corners of it, bringing it to the public, talking to them about the history, talking to them about the, the natural history, the cultural history, and um, the, the resources and, and, you know, that's such a beautiful area. And I, uh, I'd love to share the islands with you. So, uh, that sounds wonderful. I, I'll I would be in suggest touch. something like, uh, Anna Cap on, uh, in March would be my yeah. suggestion. My yeah. Strength. Maybe next year we'll give it a shot. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Thanks. Yeah, we have a problem here, um, in Palos Verdes area with mustard. Um, can you control that just by cutting or do you have to use uh, pesticides, uh, not pesticides, but uh, herbicides? Um, 
it really depends. Uh, most the, the mustard that you see the most often in California that, that turns whole mountainsides yellow is, is called black mustard, actually. Um, and that uh, we've successfully um, removed it over the course of several years with volunteers coming in and just pulling and then pulling again and then pulling again and then pulling every time it rains, never letting it go to seed, always pulling it up. Uh, the problem with pulling plants is that it tends to bring uh, buried seed from these weeds to the surface. So sometimes you pull up a weed and guess what you get when it rains? A lot more weeds. But if you um, stay on top of it, some species you can control that way. And, and I've found that black mustard um, is uh, pretty controllable that way. Uh, if you cut it, you know, um, if you cut it late in the year, right before it goes to seed, that's that's something you could do. But if it's early in the year, even though it's an annual, they'll sometimes re-sprout and just come up with another flowering head. You just want to make sure they don't go to seed. Um, the other mustard that is really nasty is the Sahara mustard, and that's oh, you know, destroying flower habitat massively out at Anza Borrego, just really totally altered hundreds and hundreds of acres of what used to be wildflowers is now mustard from the Sahara. And it's on San Nicolas Island. And, you know, we tried to control it with a, a combination of hand removal and some herbicide in, in areas where that could be done. But, um, you know, we had to agree with the Navy. We, we gave up. It's just too widespread. It's not, we're not going to get rid of it. And it is nasty. So Sahara mustard is worse than just our regular old black mustard. It's um, it's a super plant. It'll it'll sprout with no rain and grow to an inch high and bloom and seed with no rain. Uh, with rain, it'll grow to be you know three or four you know three feet high or so and produce <laughs> tremendous amounts of seed. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Mustards. You can get me going on mustards, but <laughs> I did make mustard out of black mustard once, literally. The seeds, you grind them up, add vinegar and some spices, and it was like eating wasabi, I might tell you, it's very hot. 